God's going to do tonight. Hallelujah. Why don't we stand together and lift up the name of Jesus in this house. Let's lift him up. Let's magnify him. Hallelujah. Make some noise tonight. Father, we glorify you. God, we thank you, Jesus, for your presence that we've felt here all week, God. I thank you, Lord, for what you've done in the altar tonight. God, I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, God, that you have your way in our hearts and our lives, God. I pray, Lord, that every person lead this place revive, Lord, in your revival spirit, your Lord, and will go with them to their own churches. God, in this church will be revived by your spirit. It's not by mind, not by power, but by your spirit. God, we praise you tonight. God, have your way in this place. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glad to see everybody. Let's worship him. Let's have a good time in the Lord tonight. Well, down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Oh, glory to His name. Oh, glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where He took me in. Glory to His name. Oh, glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Oh, glory to His name. Oh, glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Oh, come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge into day and be made complete. Glory to His name. Oh, glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Oh, glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this evening. This, there's, a, there's a part of this next song that we're about to sing, and it says, I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful this evening that when the day that I sought the Lord, He heard me, and He answered me, and He reached down and saved me. Hallelujah.
come we'll receive our offering tonight they were singing Holy Spirit you're welcome here I was singing how much we need him I was raised in a free will Baptist church and my mother's family went to the Methodist church and I remember 16 years old started going to the assembly of God my grandmother said you need to stay away from that wholeness church they're just up there flopping around in the floor but I saw something there that I never experienced in my life the power of God it was several, many years later Sister Rachel and I were married before I was baptized in the Holy Ghost but I knew he was real and I'm so thankful for his presence. I'm thankful that we can gather here. He shows up and he convicts hearts and he, he draws us, strengthens us, empowers us. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we praise you tonight. God, I thank you, Lord, for meeting us here. God, I thank you for this meeting. I thank you, Lord, for the churches involved. And I, I thank you, Lord, that this revival spirit will, will go there. And there will be many churches 
that will benefit from this meeting. I thank you, Lord, for your blessings upon Batavia Assembly of God. Lord, will thou not revive us again? Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in hearts and lives. And thank you for this offering. I pray, Lord, that you use it and stretch it. And bless Brother and Sister Caldwell in their ministry. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Every dime that you'll give will go to, to Brother and Sister Caldwell. And we're thankful to be able to bless them. Thank you for being here. And again, not going to call names. We're just glad you're all here. Brother Dean, Sister Peggy, you guys come and sing and worship and give God a hand of praise for them. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad to be in the house of God? <laughs> I'd rather be here than anywhere. <laughs> Except heaven. <laughs> I'm longing to go there. It's almost over. That gets me excited. This world's all tore up about what's coming. Not the church. <laughs> I've never been homesick like I am for heaven. Hallelujah. Sing it with us. There's a light in the window And the table spread in splendor Oh, someone standing by an open door Well, I can see a crystal river I must be near forever Cause I've never been this home sick before we'll see the bright light shine it's just about home time and i can see my father standing at the door this world's been a wilderness i'm ready for deliverance Cause Lord, I've never been this home sick before. Now I can see my family gather, sweet faces all familiar. Oh, but no one's old or people anymore. And this old lonesome. Heart is crying. I think I'll spread my wings for flying. Cause I've never been this home sick before. Sing it, church. Well, see the bright light shine. It's just about home time. And I can see my father standing at the door this world's in a wilderness i'm ready for deliverance oh lord i've never been this home sick before now i can see my family gathered sweet faces all familiar Oh, but no one's older people <laughs> anymore. Well, this old lonesome heart is crying. I think I'll spread my wings for flying. Cause I've never been this home sick before. Hallelujah. Well, we'll see the bright light shine. Church is just about whole time And I can't see my father standing at the door This world's been a wilderness And I'm ready for deliverance Cause the Lord, I've never been this home Sick before One more time 
can see the bright light shine. Church is just about home time. And I can see my father standing at the door. This world's been a wilderness. And I'm ready for deliverance. Cause the Lord, I've never been this home. Sick people. Oh no, I've never been this home. Sick before. Give him a praise tonight. Woo! Amen. Never been this homesick before. In Psalms 139 and verse 8, he said, If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. And if I make my bed in hell, thou art there. Where can you go on this planet earth that God is not? You can't. He's everywhere. That's the reason that scripture said, If I ascend up into heaven, you're there, Lord. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. I wonder if we really believe that sometime because how many times have we left services saying this, God wasn't within a thousand miles of that place tonight? <laughs> yeah. He was there. We just didn't connect with him. Because in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20, he said, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Wow. Did you come to connect with him tonight? Come to connect with the Lord? Because he's here. And he's big enough to do exceedingly abundantly above whatever we ask or desire. Amen. He's that big. Well, it's been good to be here this week. And thank you, Pastor, for the invitation and your hospitality. And, and uh, just a different one I've seen Brother Eddie reading his family come in back there, and then I've we got some friends here, Brother Dwayne, Sister Sammy. We uh, befriended about five years ago, and they've been here Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday tonight, and uh, we're we're so thankful. And Brother Fairchild here preached for him in Missouri uh, before the Civil War, wasn't it? I'm not sure. <laughs> been a long, long time ago there, but we're just happy to have everybody here. Let me see again tonight how many preachers we've got in the building. I, I want to see all these hands. Man, I, I, love, I love the people of God. That's right. Love the people of God, and I appreciate each and every one of you. Well, today had just been one of those busy days. I had to go to Little Rock for a meeting and then come back, and on the way there praying, and on the way back praying, and I feel like the Lord has laid something in my heart uh, for us tonight. I want you to turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter number 1. I'm going to read verse 26 and verse number 27. What I want to preach about tonight is the DNA of God that God has placed in mankind. Now, there's a lot of things happening in our world right now that is trying to put God out of everything possible. Uh, they're even building artificial intelligence. And, you know, 20 years ago, we would have thought that would have been a cartoon. But it's not. It's real. They're building artificial people, robotic. And, uh, man, it's just a big thing that's going on. But God purposely placed his DNA inside of mankind for reason and a purpose. And from the time God placed it there, the devil has been out to destroy the DNA that God has placed in mankind. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, now you preachers that are here, you can preach at least eight or ten messages out of this one verse of Scripture. I refer to it often because it says a lot here for us. And God said, let us make man. Here's God's DNA. And our image and after our likeness. Two things that God put in man, and here they are. Image and likeness of God 
in man. And then he said, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and creeping things that creepeth up on the earth. Now look at verse 27 because I'm going to do a comparison here in a moment of time. So God created man in his own image. Look here. It deals with image here. And in the image of God created he them, male and female female. Let us pray. Father, as we come to you tonight, I am so thankful. I am so thankful, God, that we have such a privilege as this to come together, Lord, to lift up our voices in praise, our hearts in praise to you. But God, we're asking that you would meet with us in a special way tonight. Let this word so penetrate deep within our hearts and our lives. Let us walk in the fellowship of your love. Lead us in the stillness of your kind spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord. Praise God, praise God. You may be seated tonight. Sister Rachel's on the board back there posting these scriptures. And sis, I'll do the best I can to stay with this tonight. I, I, I make out lists, but I don't do very good with it. I, I tell you, we were in church about a year or so ago, and I gave the lady a list. And, and I started out, and I gave her one scripture, read the text, and then I throwed four at her that I didn't have written down. And she jumped out in the middle of the aisle and just, said, and then just walked off. I mean, just walked off. And I thought, well, they'll have to look them up their self now. But anyway, these scriptures here said that in verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1, God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. In the image of God and in the likeness of God is what he made man in the beginning. Now, what is that? Image is what we look like. Likeness is what we act like. So God made Adam to look like him in this fashion. Adam had arms, he had legs, he had a head, and he had a body. And he passed that on in the human race. But also, Adam was made in the likeness of God, which just simply means he was created immortal. He was without sin. He was able to, to live on this planet Earth without the touch of sin on his life. He was made in the image and in the likeness of God. And, and uh, Rachel, go to Genesis 2 and verse number 7. And look here what this said. In Genesis 2, verse number 7, he said, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now watch this. Let me explain this to you. From the, from the Hebrew standpoint, here's what they tell us in their writings. It said, God physically came down from heaven to this earth. When he got on this earth, he cast his image in the dust of the ground, and then with his finger, he traced out his image, not his shadow, but his image. He traced his image out in the dust of the ground, a head, body, arms, and legs. Then he backed up and he breathed into that traced out image. And when he did, Adam just peeled right out of the ground. That is the creative power of God. But God made Adam in his image and after his likeness. Now then, if, if you will, Rachel, let's move to Genesis 5. Now, if you notice the scriptures I just read in Genesis 1, I'll start in verse 1, chapter 5. In Genesis 1 and, and verse 26, the image and the likeness of God, then verse 27 deals with the image of God, just the image of God. The likeness of God is not dealt with until these verses. In, in Genesis 5 and verse number 1. He said, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Now, oh, could I preach an hour on that right there? In the day that God created man, and in the likeness of God, look what he said, made he him. He deals with the 
likeness here. Now let's read on. Verse number two. Male and female created he them and blessed them. Watch this now. Here's singular. And called their name Adam from the day they were created. And Adam was a hundred and thirty years old. He begot a son after his own likeness and his image and called his name Seth. Now let me point out to you why this is important. God deals with image of God in chapter 1, but he deals with the likeness of God in chapter 5. Why is this? In the fall of man, when man, when Adam and Eve sinned and they disobeyed God in the fall of man, they never lost the image of God. They lost the likeness of God. They lost their covering of likeness of God. They lost that. Why? Because the devil was out to destroy the DNA of God in mankind. He come in the, in the garden of Eden to Eve, and when he did, he deceived Eve, and when he deceived Eve, she partook of the forbidden fruit, which was against the commandment of God. Oh, oh Sister Rachel, let's do this. I, I don't remember putting this one down. Go to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 14. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 14. Now watch this. Adam was not deceived. Do you see that? Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. Here's what that said. Adam sinned willfully. Eve was deceived in the fall, but Adam sinned willfully. What is all of that about? Let me take a little detour here. That will bless somebody tonight. Adam was there when Eve partook of the forbidden fruit, and she gave the fruit to him. He willfully willfully knew what he was doing. He willfully partook of the forbidden fruit. And when he did, both of them, both of them, their eyes were open and they knew they were naked. But why did Adam sin willfully? What was the deal behind Adam sinning willfully when he knew the penalty? He knew what was going to happen. He knew that on God's routine visit, well, we just might well put this up here. Rachel, go back to Genesis 3 and verse 8. Genesis 3 and verse number 8. And look at this. Follow me closely because I want to show you something from the scripture. Genesis 3 and verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees in the garden. They knew they had sinned. They knew they had disobeyed God. But Adam also knew that on God's routine visit, he would remove Eve from the garden of Eden, cast her out of the Garden of Eden, leave Adam in the Garden of Eden, and they would forevermore be separated. So Adam willfully becomes sin with Eve, so they would not be separated. Now, Rachel, will you go? <laughs> uh, I'll get back on track in a minute, but you're doing good, girl. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 45. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse Verse number 45. Look here what this says to us in the scripture. He said uh, that it is written, the first Adam, talking about the Garden of Eden, Adam, the first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Jesus is referred to here as the last Adam. Let me help you correct something. I hear this a lot. Well, the first Adam and the second Adam. It does not say second Adam. It says the last Adam. If it said second, there could have been a third and a fourth. It is last. There's a Garden of Eden Adam, and there is a Savior Adam, last Adam, in the Scripture. Why is Jesus referred to as Adam? Here's why. The Garden of Eden Adam willfully becomes sin with his wife Eve, so they would not be separated. Jesus willfully came from heaven to this earth. 
and took my sin upon him, your sin upon him, so we would not be separated through eternity. He brought together the fact that we could be redeemed through and by the plan of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, let's look at this in a moment of time and want to want to follow this through tonight because the devil tried to destroy the likeness of God in mankind. And he did in Adam and Eve. But God said, I like what I've done. I like that I have made man in my image and after my likeness. I like that. So he made a way that man can regain the likeness of God and that's through salvation. You and I can regain the very DNA of God through salvation in Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior. Go back to Genesis 5, Rachel. Verse number 2. In ver- well, let, let's do 1 again, all right? I apologize. Go back to verse 1. Genesis 5 and verse number 1. Because this is where God deals with a, a, the, the likeness of God in mankind. He said this is the book of the generations of, of, of Adam. Uh, Rachel, I'm apologizing all over myself, but I'm going I'm to let you flip flop back and forth because I want to prove a point here tonight. Look at this. This is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man. And in the likeness of God created he them. Now remember, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Rachel, will you flip over to Matthew 1 and verse 1. Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 1. Now you preachers that are here, this will preach. Take it home with you. Preach it like it ought to be preached. (laughs) I'm just fooling with it right now. Watch this now. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 1, this is the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. All in chapter 5, it's the book of Adam. But now then, the generation of Adam. But Matthew 1 said... This is the book of the generations of Jesus Christ. What's that all about? It's proving again the first Adam and the last Adam. But the first Adam, when you read chapter 5, it gets into the genealogy there. And it says this, Methuselah lived 969 years and he died. And Moses lived 950 years and he died. Adam lived 930 years and he died. You can see that. But when you read the genealogy of Jesus Christ, death is not mentioned. (laughs) Not one time is it mentioned there. What is it saying? Death came through Adam's fall, but Jesus Christ brought everlasting life. Amen. Oh, could I? I'm dying to preach on that. I really am because there's so much good stuff wrapped up in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. I know somebody said, how's that, how's that guy get anything out of genealogy? Well, it's amazing. It, it is amazing. Let me help you preachers preach something here. Write this down. In the, in the book of Matthew, there's five women that are mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. Five. Mary is the fifth one, but the number five is the number of grace. Oh, oh wow. All the rest of them had problems and issues. They wasn't real good people, but they're in the genealogy of Jesus. But when Mary came in and she mentioned, it's a good Mother's Day message, preacher. It's a good Mother's Day. You can preach about all them women. I mean, you can preach about their life and everything else. But Mary brought the Savior into the world, which is the number five of grace. Five is the number of grace mentioned in the Word of God. Just thought I'd throw that in. That thrills me every time I think about that. All right. Let's look at something here this, this afternoon. When the devil deceived Eve and Adam uh, followed after the issue of sin. They lost the likeness of God. That's what man done. He never lost the image of God. He lost the likeness of God. Now then, all right, Rachel, go to St. John chapter 3. I'm going to read verse 3, verse 5, and verse number 7. We can read the whole thing, but I want you to get your mind wrapped around 
what these verses are saying, all right? In, in St. John chapter 3, in verse number 3, remember, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus here. He is part of the synagogue. He's part of the order of law. But watch what he said. Jesus answered Nicodemus and said, Verily, verily, I send you except the man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Notice the born again issue there. Verse number 5. Verse number 5, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I send you except the man be born of water and spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Then verse number 7, Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Three times in the first seven verses, born again is mentioned. So what is he talking about? In the fall of man, man never lost the image of God. He lost the likeness of God. But when you come to an altar prayer and you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin, here's literally what happens. The sin issue is moved out of your life and cast as far as the east is from the west and birthed in you is the likeness of God that was lost in the fall of man. Now 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17. Look here. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. Therefore if any man be in Christ. He's a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold all things are become new. When you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin, he moves the sin and cast him as far as the east is from the west and then he births in you what was lost in the fall of man. Now you're a new creature. You're a new person. You're, you're born again. You're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now you got something living inside of you that is part of the DNA of God. It is the likeness of God that God placed when he made man in the beginning of time. Are you following me tonight? All right, hang with me. God said, devil, you may have caused them to lose the likeness, but I kind of like the fact I put my DNA in them. So I'm going to make it where they can get it again. They can have the DNA of God. Listen, when you're saved by the grace of God, he becomes your heavenly father. Oh, you're his earthly sons and daughters. That means we're family because you're carrying the DNA of God in the likeness of God living inside of you. Now, I don't have to preach that. I preached that in a message and probably preached it here and other places around here about uh, gaining the, the, the likeness of God. But then the devil was not happy with that. He wanted to destroy the image of God. He wanted to destroy the image of God, what mankind looks like. Now, in our culture, or in our race of people, doesn't make any difference what color you are. We're all different sizes. Have you noticed that? Everybody has a fingerprint of their own. We all have our own DNA that's passed down. But now then, the devil tried to distort the image of God. The image of God he tried to distort. Rachel, did I give you this girl? I'm, I'm not. Uh, it's way down at the bottom. We'll go down there and get it. Genesis 3 and verse 15. All right. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. What I'm about ready to read you is the first scripture in the Bible that talks about the virgin birth of Jesus Christ and the coming of a Savior into this world. This is right after the fall of Adam and Eve. And God here is speaking to the devil. Here's what he said, Genesis 3 and verse number 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy heel, and or it shall bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise its heel. Now look here, what he said. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. The word seed there, seed there in, in the Hebrew is zera, Z-E-R-A, zera, which means offspring. Oh, 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 don't that knock your hat in the creek. But look here. He said, I will put uh, 
enmity, that's hatred, between you and the woman, between your seed devil, which an offspring, and the seed of woman. Now, the woman does not carry the seed. She carries the egg. So here's the first scripture that speaks of a virgin birth in the Word of God. And God just simply made the proclamation, He's coming into this world, and you can't do anything about it, Lucifer. I'm going to send a Savior in this world, and when he gets here, he's going to bust your head. His heel is going to stand on top of your head. Your head's going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. That's what he said. He made that proclamation in this verse of Scripture. Now, how did it happen? How did the devil do his best to distort the human body? The human body. Let's read that. Go to Genesis chapter number 6, and I'm going to read verse 3 in verse number 4. I think I, I gave, yeah, there, there you go. He said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, but that he is flesh. What did he say? Here's he's cutting the age down right here. He said his days or his time will be 120 years. Now, the, the age of mankind has been moved three times in the scripture. The first time, man lived almost a thousand years. The oldest man man is Methuselah, 969 years that we have recorded. They may have beat that. I don't know. But then the second time, God moved it from almost a 1,000 down to 120. Uh, Rachel, will you go to Psalms 90 and verse 10? Psalms 90 and verse 10. I tell you, I've been trying to do this for a year now, writing these scriptures down and trying to follow them. And you can see, I don't do that good a job with it at all. But anyway, he said this. In Psalms 90 and verse 10, the days, now this is our time slot here. This is where you and I live at now. The days of our year, three score and ten. That's 70, and if it be reason of strength, 80 years. So 70 to 80 years. Now listen to me. I've heard people say, God's promised me 70 to 80 years. Now that's not what that says at all. That's a mile marker of faith. There's a lot of people who don't make it to 70. There's a lot of people. Talk to them families that's lost children and try to tell them that God's promised you 70 years on this earth. It's a mile marker of faith. And there's people that beat 80. There, I, I, I preach funerals of people over 100 to the years of time. It's a mile marker of faith. It's not a promise. It's a mile marker of faith. I don't want to get in on that. But now let's go back, if you will, to uh, to to this scriptures here, Genesis chapter number uh, 6. For a moment of time, I read verse 3, and he said this, My spirit shall not always strive with man, but that man is flesh. His days will be 120 years. Now look at verse number 4. Here is a very controversial verse of scripture in verse number 4. He said, And there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they and and they bare children. They they had children by these, and he said they were mighty men of old men of renown. They were giants, superhuman giants in the scripture that it's talking about here. Now I know there's two theories on this. Let let me just show you which one's right, okay? There's a theory that says this is the sons of Seth with the daughters of Cain. That can't be right because they were giants before the flood and they were giants after the flood and Seth and Cain's bunch died in the flood. The only ones left was Noah and his three sons and their wives. So that's not it. The sons of God are referred to angels as sons of God. Now watch this. The fallen angels that was cast out with Lucifer. Let, let's read that. I don't want you to take my opinion on this. Hang on. I want to find this for a moment of time and help you understand this. Rachel, go to Revelation chapter 12 and ver put up verse 4. Now I'm going to go across the page and pick up verse 9, all right? In, in Revelation 12 and verse number 4, he said in his, the, this is the devil that was cast out of heaven. He said, and, the, and his tail drew a third part of the stars with him and did cast them to the 
the earth. Third part of the stars. Look at there. Third part of the stars. What is the stars? Verse 9. Look at verse number 9. Revelation 12 and verse number 9. And he said, And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent, which is called the devil and Satan, that deceived the whole world and cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So that clears it up right there. The devil took one-third of the angelic host of heaven with him when he was cast out of heaven. Those angels came back down to this earth and they intermixed with the human uh, uh, DNA that God had placed in the human for them to be after the image of God. And the Bible said they were superhuman people. I mean, they were superhuman people. All right, uh, uh, Rachel, we go to Deuteronomy 3 and verse 11. Let me show you how superhuman they was. Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse number 11. This is a king. His name's Og and he was a giant. Look at his bed. <laughs> Look how big his bed was. His bed was nine cubics long and four cubics wide. What is that? Approximately eight foot long and eight foot wide. That dude was nearly grown. He was taller than a telephone pole. We're talking about a superhuman being that, uh, that was distorted from the DNA of God. And God just simply said, devil, you can't have that. By the way, that's the reason the flood came. The flood came and destroyed all of that. The flood came and destroyed that. But it happened again after the flood. Go back to Genesis 6 and verse number 4. Let me reread that. Genesis 6 and 4. The Bible said in verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. Also after that means before the flood and after the flood. Now watch this. God preserved the original seed that he had created. Look at verse 9. While we're in Genesis 6 and verse number 9. These are the generations of Noah. Oh, I like this. He was a just man and perfect in his generations. What does it mean? There was no intermingling of the fallen angels with his ancestry. You can follow it. Adam down through Seth and right on down to Noah. Uh, he was perfect in his generation. God spared the original image that he had created man in. Placed him on an ark drowned all the rest of them and put them out here on this earth. But then it happened again. And there's one giant in the scripture that there is a story about. And his name was Goliath. And that's in 1 Samuel 17 and verse number 40. 1 Samuel chapter 17. You know the story. Goliath is out there and he's making a threat. Send your best man out here. And I'm sure the army of Israel was saying, look at the feet on that dude. It takes two cows and a calf to make him a pair of shoes. Look at what, and I mean huge, abnormal, and, and he's wanting to fight with somebody else. If, oh, if you win, we'll be your slaves, but if you win, or if I win, then you'll be our slaves, and so on and so forth. And David heard him define the army of the living God. Now David is just a kid. He's just a, he, he just a kid, keeping the sheep. He has no military training, but he got mad. You know, I hear people say, well, preacher, you know, I don't want to get mad. Well, sometimes you need to. I'm just going to tell you that. And don't, don't go here, Rachel. I'm going to tell them where it's at because somebody needs to hear this. In the, in, in the book of Ephesians 4 and 26, he said, be ye angry and sin not. It's not a sin to get mad. It's when you lose it. <laughs> That's when it really comes in sin. I, preacher, how can you get mad without losing it? I don't know. I don't I don't have to tell you about that. You're going to have to ask somebody that knows how to do that. Usually when I get mad, I'm mad. I mean, I'm really mad. I'm ready to cloud up and rain all over somebody whenever I get mad. But anyway, David got mad about all of this. That giant out there in the valley, and he's 
to find the army of God, and he said, I'll fight him, I'll fight him. Well, King Saul wasn't having no takers on this, and he done gave a pretty good prize. He said, for the man that go out there and whoop that giant, I'll let him marry my daughter. I think he thought she was safe. I, I really believe he thought, she's safe. There ain't nobody gonna take that dude out there in the field, but David said, I will, I'll go fight. So Saul called him in, and when Saul called all demands, how much military military training you got? I got none, but I'll tell you this, buddy. There's a lion come out against my daddy's sheep one time, and I smote him. I mean, I got him by the beard, and I smote him. You know, we read that story, and you don't think much about that, do you? Let me tell you something. I got a hold of the lion one time, and it's the most powerful animal I ever had a hold of in my life. Whenever I was building houses in Pine Bluff, I went down the railroad salvage trying to find a window that would match to the one I broke out. <laughs> and so I was trying to find and and, uh, and they had this, it's at the railroad depot and big long building, big shed off the back. All their windows are stacked up there and it's got this real heavy wire on it. And I opened that gate and I whistled and there wasn't no dog come. And I'm walking down through there and I'm just looking at all them windows. I got three quarters of the way back and stepping out from behind some patio doors was a line. L-I-O-N. They had put it in there. They turned him loose at night in the yard because of the thievery. And after they turned the line loose, they never lost another thing. Not another thing. I wish I had known that earlier. I'm going to tell you. He stepped out, and I had to take a double take. And I'm thinking, most folks got a German shepherd. <laughs> These folks has got a lion. Now, lions are pigeon-toed. I didn't know that. But when I seen him coming, he's pigeon-toed. His feet went right over the top of the other. And I stood there. He's about this tall. He's got a mane around him and, I, and a big collar. And I said, kitty, kitty, kitty. <laughs> that didn't phase him. I mean, and, and, and the first lick, he knocked me down. Now they said he was playing with me. But 250 pounds of fun is way too much fun for me. I'm telling you that. I had him by the collar and I, he couldn't get to me because when he'd try, he just pushed me. <laughs> he, I was was on my back, he was on my chest, but I had him by the collar, and I was strong enough that when he pushed me, my whole body moved. It, it moved. I looked like a dirt pile whenever I finally got out of there. I was sweaty when in there, but I soaked up all of that dirt back there, and he's, he's scratching with his paw. When I got back to the door and got up, I shut my door door up in that gate and just skin it out. And I stood there for a minute just mud in. I'm thinking, you know that old boy I'm building this house for needs to experience this. So I went and got on the phone. I said, you need to come down here and pick your wind out. I'm not going to tell the rest of the story, but it wasn't good. I can tell you that. But anyway, here is, uh, I know when David said a lion come out against my sheep, he said, I killed it. I've got a lot of admiration for the dude. I, I'm telling you that. I had nothing Nothing to kill the lion with, or I would have. I mean, I was just trying to save my life, and they kept telling me, he's just having fun. Well, when you're on the other end of the fun, it ain't real fun. It's serious stuff at that point. But anyway, and David said, a bear came out. I don't want to find out how big a bear is, but he is qualifying himself to fight the, fight the giant, because he said, I really don't see no different between that giant out there there, and the lion and the bear. And, so, and he convinced Saul. He really did. And so Saul said, well, here's my armor. Now David is just a, a little guy, and Saul's big, tall, and, and, and king, and he's got a special armor, and he put his helmet on his head, and uh, it fell down over his eyes, and, and, and Saul wore size 14, and David wore eight and a half shoe, and he put his boots on, and, and, and you can just get a picture of this. Old David's got his head back where he can see out from around the helmet, he dragging that shield and, and scooting them boots with a sword. Uh, kind of remind me of church people sometime trying to do something they ain't qualified to do. You understand? But when he got out of the edge of town, he said, I've not proved this stuff. 
He laid the shield down. He laid the sword down, stepped out of them boots, took the helmet off, got in his back pocket, and took a slingshot out and popped it and said, now let's go giant hunting right here. And now listen to me. I want to show you something from the Word of God. David went to fight the giant with just a slingshot. Oh, wow. Wasn't he smart? Look at that. But he had faith in God. Verse 40. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 40. I love this verse of Scripture. He took the staff in his hand. He had a staff. I preached a little bit about that the other night. He had a staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag. Here's the answer. Which he had even in a script. Wow. And his sling in his hand. The word script there, when you look it up in a Strong's Concordance, it refers you back to the shepherd's bag. But it said he put it in a shepherd's bag, even in a script. But when you look script up in the Bible dictionary, it's parchment. It's dried animal skins with scriptures written on them. So here's what David done. He picked up five stones and covered them with the word of the Almighty God. He stuck them down in the shepherd's bag, right there probably about Exodus 3 where God said I am the I am I can just make things happen and he went out to meet Goliath and he had the staff in his hand here comes Goliath and Goliath is mad you've sent a kid out here to I'll feed you to the buzzards I'll let the animals to the field eat you and David said you come to me with a sword and with a spear and a shield but I come to you in the name of the God of the armies of Israel he reached in there about Exodus 3 and he pulled a stone out and he put it in that sling and he wound it up and when he turned it loose Exodus 3 guided that stone to the forehead of the giant he didn't fall backwards he fell frontwards that, that was an act of God it should have knocked him backwards but he fell frontwards David went down there and pulled his sword out lopped his head off now verse number 54 look at verse number 54 and I'm in 1 Samuel 17 if you're trying to follow me verse 54 David took the head of the Philistine and he brought it to Jerusalem but he put his armor in the tent now look what he said he took Goliath's head all the way back to Jerusalem which was 50 miles from that a battlefield 50 is jubilee you understand that David carried that big head back into town 50 miles he took old Goliath's head put it in Jerusalem now let me show you something tonight go to Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 33 when Jesus was carrying his cross well, look what it said and when they were come to the place called Golgotha that is to say the place of a skull tear that apart Golgotha is Go Goliath of Goth on Calvary's hill when God said I will cause the your seed. In your seed one day will bruise his heel. His heel will bruise your head. On top of that skull mountain there, God put an X and said, put the cross here. Because 4,000 years ago, I said I'll have the seed of woman that will conquer the seed of the devil where Goliath was buried. There was a cross that was hung there and Jesus hung on that old rugged cross. And when he did his heel, is standing on the seed of the head of Satan's offspring. You understand that because it was there in the word of God that he brought the promise to come to pass. He said I'll, his heel will bruise your head. Your head will bruise his heel. God said it's going to happen and it happened just the way God said. Wow. <laughs> what are you saying? The DNA of God he preserved. Look at yourself when you get home. And the mirror, it don't make any difference how fat you are, how skinny you are, how tall you are, how short you are. It don't matter. You're the image of God. That's a DNA the devil tried to destroy. But God preserved it through Noah and brought his promise to pass. A 4,000 year old promise. I, preacher, I'm, I don't really like myself. Start liking yourself.
Because it's who you are that God made you. He made you. He made Adam in the image of God and in the likeness of God. And the devil tried to steal the likeness and God regained it through salvation for us. But he preserved the image of God when he brought Noah on board the ark with his three sons. And no matter how much the devil tried to destroy mankind, God has preserved it through the years of time. Wow, wow, that's the reason why that when our body dies, it will be resurrected. Why? Because it is made in the image of God. Oh, let's read some of that. Uh, uh, Rachel, go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse Verse 35, and, and I'll read 38, and then 49, and verse 50. Watch this now. In 1 Corinthians 15 and 45, or 35, he said this. He said, some men will say, how are the dead raised, and with what body do they come? Oh, oh, what body are they going to come up with? The body you got right now. You understand that? It will be changed from a corruptible body to an incorruptible body, but because you are the image of God. Verse 38. Look at verse 38. He said this, but God has given it a body as it has pleased him to every seed his own body. Now you can take that home, tear that apart. That's good. God's going to give every seed his own body. Verse 49. As we born the image of the earthy, we'll also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. I'm going to read on, Rachel, if you don't mind there. Verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. God's going to bring the body forth. Why? Because it's his image. He put a soul and spirit in you. Your parents gave you your biological body. But God preserved the seed because we are in the image of God. When you get discouraged, just walk in front of the mirror sometime. Look in the mirror and tell yourself, I am in the image of God. I'm somebody headed somewhere. Yeah. We need to know these things. Because the devil whispers in our ear constantly, you're nothing. You will never mount to a hill of beans. Look at you. You can't control your appetite. Now, he's told me that a bunch of times. I'm going to help you fat, fat folks here tonight. God's into fat. God is into fat. You'll never read in the scripture, he said, kill a skinny calf. <laughs> It's always the fatted calf. In Exodus, he said, the fat's mine. <laughs> I'm feeling better about myself already. <laughs> Miss Peggy tells me I'll take that out of context, but I like how I said it. <laughs> We're the image of God, and we regain the likeness of God through salvation. And one day, a trumpet's going to sound. And when it sounds, the whole person, spirit, soul, and body, will be preserved blameless when the trumpet sounds. Now, this body will wear out. It gets old. It gets sick. And it dies. You can't keep that from happening. But God said, I hadn't lost it. I'm going to raise it from the dead. Why? Because it's his own image. And he doesn't lose anything of himself. Trying to encourage somebody here tonight. Has God made you a promise that it hasn't come to pass yet? He told the devil, 
There'll be one born of the seed of woman, a virgin birth, and he'll bruise your head of your offspring, and you'll just bruise his, bruise his heel. And he took it all the way to Calvary before that promise come to pass, but he brought it to pass. If God's made you a promise, the only way it won't come to pass if you just forget it and leave it alone. But as long as you recall it by faith, it's coming. It's coming. I'm going to help you with something right here now. How long have I been preaching? You tell time like I do. I like that. Preacher, what about my unsaved children? I've been praying about them. I'm not seeing anything happen, anything come to pass. You know why? Because they have a will, and God has to deal with that will in time. God won't change anybody's will to honor your faith, but he set things in motion so he can touch them. I'm going to encourage somebody tonight. This is not even part of this message, so Rachel, let me look it up. Uh, it's in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8. Watch this. Revelation 5 and verse 8 said, When he had taken the book, four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Wow. What does it mean? God bottles up your prayers. When you thought he wasn't hearing you, when you thought he wasn't listening, there's golden vows in heaven full of odors, and he doesn't stop there. He said, which are the prayers of the saints. You don't even have to be alive to see that come to pass. Because God cans up the prayers of the saints of God. And when you thought he wasn't listening, he's got them in a golden vial full of odors, and it, which are the prayers of the saints. And in God's time, when he sets everything up, he'll deal with them one final time, I really believe, before he calls them out of this earth. So don't you be despondent or despair. Keep praying. Keep praying. And when it comes time for you leaving this world and you hadn't seen the result, you leave here with that promise tucked in your spirit. God's going to do it. He's going to deal with them one final time. If God has made you a promise, this is what I felt coming down the road today. And I hope I explained this good enough where everybody can get your minds wrapped around it tonight. But God said, I have made promises that they have just pushed aside because they haven't happened. But I want to renew them in their spirit and in their thinking. Would you bow your heads with me, please, tonight? I always like to ask this. If there's anybody in the building unsaved, you don't know the Lord. Always want to give somebody a chance to pray. Is there anybody here you don't know Jesus? You're unsaved, you're lost. But you just slip your hand up and by you lifting your hand, you're making that statement. I need the Lord in my life. I need Jesus in my life. Is there anybody here? You see, if you're here tonight and you're unsaved, you don't have the likeness of God in you. You have to gain that by it being birthed in you. Is there anybody here? Now then, I want to get to what I was preaching about tonight. How many people in this building tonight, you feel 
God has made you a promise and it hasn't come to pass yet. Maybe some sitting on this seat tonight, the Holy Spirit just reminded you of the promise you feel like God made to you. You just had seen the results and pushed it on the back burner, but God's reminding you tonight. He's made you a promise. I believe God's wanting to renew those promises and make them as fresh as they was the day you felt God made you that promise. Here's what I want you to do. Will you get up and come and just stand in front of these altars tonight and say, God, I'm coming for you to renew that promise in my spirit. I hadn't seen it happen, but I've got some more word to go with it tonight. I got some more faith to stand on now. And I want that renewed in my spirit. Just come on, stand up here tonight. Across the front of this building. God, I'm just going to trust you to renew this promise. If he can bring a 4,000 year old promise to pass in detail, he can bring the promise he's made to you in detail. Just come on up here and stand here tonight. Just stand here tonight. How great is our God. God has made you a promise. It hasn't come to pass. But tonight, there's a renewing that's going to take place. A shaking in your spirit that's going to take place. I recall a testimony that was given me several years ago. Church in Louisiana, prominent family in the church. And their oldest son got in drugs and, and just disappeared. No contact, no contact at all. Was gone for several years. But that mom and dad just kept praying. There was a revival going on in that church and the crowds had just kept increasing, increasing, increasing. And the evangelist preached that night on the prodigal son. And while he was preaching, he said, I'm just going to give the prodigal son a name. He called him Little Charlie. Nobody knew, but that son that had been prodigal for many years slipped in the back of that church, a beard down to his belt, hair down his back. Nobody knew him, but his name's Charlie. That preacher preached on the prodigal son that night and said, I'm just going to call him little Charlie. And boy, he went down the line. And when he gave an altar call that night, God moved on little Charlie. He came to the altar. He was praying at the altar. Nobody even knew who he was. But God directed that dad to go down there and pray with that young man, not knowing who he was. And that dad knelt in front of that boy. Just begin to pray. Finally, little Charlie looked up at him with tears flowing from his eyes, and he said, Dad, I've come home. I've come home. God can do it. God can do it. Now, let me help you with this tonight. Preachers, if you'll come and in front of if you'd like to you don't have to but we'd like for you to come and help us pray in front of these folks here tonight but you that are at your seats there's some struggles going on here around this altar right now I mean some struggles we need your help get up here and just crowd in behind them tonight and begin to call on the name of the Lord because I believe 
from the bottom of my soul tonight and God's trying to renew some promises in some people's life with a fresh touch and a fresh blessing and a fresh victory. You want to be part of it? Just gather up here. And let's just see God do what He does tonight. Gather in around with you, preacher. Just scatter out and start praying that God renew the promise that He made to them with a fresh touch and a fresh anointing and a fresh grace from heaven. Get ready for God to touch you tonight.
What do I do when darkness lingers? What do I do when I lose faith? I run to you. I run to you. From the storm to your arms, I run to you. I make my way to your secret place.
prevail me and you never let me down when my world is sinking you're my solid ground I run to you I ran to you from the storm to your arms I run to you I make my way
This young man has asked for the pastors to come and pray for him. For he has his situation in his back and just wants healing. And so would you come and let's gather around him. with you a testimony I love Pentecost and I'm thankful that I'm Pentecostal I told you a little bit when I was young I started going to Lurton Assembly Sister Lily Vanderpool saying it's real it's real I know I know it's real it's the Pentecostal power and I know I know it's real we were pastoring at Buttermilk, Rehoboth Assembly, and I had a free will Baptist preacher come and hold a revival for us, which is not me. I, I don't I would not wouldn't normally do that. And he he was wanting the Holy Ghost. And so after the service, we prayed for him right here in the middle of the church. And everybody prayed, and you, you know how we do. We push and we pull and we say, hold on and turn loose and, and all that good stuff. And nothing happened. So Thomas went over. There was this door on the side, and he went over there to that door, and he just slumped down on the floor against that door. Discouraged. The, our altar service went on. There was people being blessed and touched, and it, it was just awesome. And I... I I, I just felt so bad for him. And I went over there to him and I said, Thomas, I said, I, I prayed for the baptism of the Holy Ghost from the time I was 16 till I was about 30. Sister Rachel was pregnant with Connor when I got baptized the Holy Ghost at Pleasant Grove. And I said, it was so easy all the time. I made it so hard. And you know, Pentecostal people, Pentecostal people that had grown up in this thing told me, you already have it. You, don't, you already have it. I knew that wasn't right. We have to speak in other tongues. And I, I wrestled and thought, and finally, God filled me with the Holy Ghost. Brother Austin was preaching, but I went over there to Thomas and to the wall of that church, and I said, Thomas, the Bible says that they all spake with other tongues when the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. And I said, you, you hear sounds and your words in your mind that you never heard before. I don't, I'm not going to tell you the words to say. God will tell you the words, but you got to speak them out. His eyes got big as saucers. And he said, I've been laying in bed at night hearing these sounds and I didn't know what they were. And, 
And I said, will you get up and let us pray for you again? And he come out there in the middle again. And we laid hands on him. And that boy began to speak in other tongues uh, like, a, like a pro. Like somebody that's been speaking in tongues for years and years. Uh, and I, it, just, it just broke loose in that place. Uh, and I'm, he's not free will Baptist anymore. He's pastoring one of our churches now. And I give God the praise and the glory. But it's real. It's real. I know. Oh, I know it's real. I don't know this young man's story. But I can see myself standing right where he is. As a 16-year-old boy. Every altar service that they prayed for people to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, there I was. And I just got discouraged and thought, well, it, I guess it's not for me. Not, it's nothing's happening. I thought God would get a hold of my mouth and move my tongue. Nothing, none of that ever happened. But when I spoke out what He gave me, He filled me with the Holy Ghost. Would some of you spirit-filled believers, would you come up here and lay your hands on this man? He wants more of God and last night we was talking to some young girls up here and Sister Peggy was testifying about people singing in the Holy Ghost uh, and different things that, that the Holy Ghost has done and that young girl said I didn't even know that was such a thing and I thought how sad in our Pentecostal churches that our kids don't know what God can do Hallelujah. Would you stretch your hands in this direction and let's pray for this young man. God gives us the desires of our heart. Well, glory, 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 somebody touch me. Glory, 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 somebody touch me. Glory, 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 somebody touch me. It must have been the hand of the Lord. Well, glory, 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 somebody touch me. Glory, 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 somebody touch me. Glory, 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 somebody touch me. And it must have been the hands of the Lord. Well, while I was praying, somebody touch me. While I was praying, somebody touch me. Oh, while I was praying. Somebody touch me, it must have been the hand of the Lord. Well, glory, 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 somebody touch me. Glory, 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 somebody touch me. Glory, 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 somebody touch me. It must have been the hand of the Lord. Glory, 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 somebody touch me. Glory, glory, glory. Somebody touch me, glory, glory, glory. Somebody touch me, and it must have been the head of the Lord. While I was singing, somebody touch me. While I was singing, somebody touch me. While I was singing, somebody touch me, and it must have been the head of the Lord. While I was praying, somebody touch me. While I was praying, somebody touch me. While I was praying, somebody. it must have been the hand of the Lord. Glory, 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 somebody touch me. Glory, 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 somebody touch me. Glory, glory, glory. Somebody touch me, and it must have been the head of the Lord. While I was singing, somebody touch me. While I was singing, somebody touch me. While I was singing, somebody touch me. Must have been the head of the Lord. Let's stand together tonight. 
As we dismiss, let's lift up Jesus one more time before we leave. Let's thank him for this great meeting. Let's thank him for Brother Sister Caldwell. And just ask God's blessing upon them. He continue to use them mightily. I don't know about you, but I'm going to be I'm strengthened by this meeting. Hallelujah. My, my life has been changed by this meeting. Hallelujah. Let's lift him up. Father, we glorify you. God, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you've done. God, and I pray, Lord, you continue to move in every heart and life. God, I thank you, Lord, that you give us the desires of our heart. God, I thank you for Pentecost. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for your anointing. God, and use us mightily for your kingdom. Use us everywhere we go, I pray. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah.